Good afternoon, everyone. I am Pastor Bob Babich, for those who don't know me. I'm the pastor of this church, and I bid you a warm welcome this afternoon to this special uh, time when we think and reminisce and learn from the life of the servant of God, Pastor Alan Robertson. Uh, I'm glad that you have come in such a large number and uh, that we can think about his life and that we can reminisce and uh, recollect some memories and that we can look for the future when we will one day be all in the kingdom of God, hopefully. Um, I usually like to begin with, uh, with few words from this book that we all commonly read and that we call uh, like our spiritual home. And uh, I am going to read from Psalm 27 this morning, few words, few lines, where David says following, 
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold on my, of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. And then finally, verse 5 says, For in the day of trouble, as we're all uh, getting together to say goodbye, for in the day of trouble and many other troubles, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high up on a rock. These were the words that Pastor Robertson read so many times and I'm sure preached many times. And so we are all together as I said, opening the same book that he was reading and preaching from, and we are being encouraged, I hope, that even in the days of trouble, even when everything is against us, that when we're losing even the footing under our, our own feet, we can be safe in the house of the Lord. We can be under his protection as we are now. And so that is good to know. And it is good to know that even death is not the enemy with Jesus, who is the life and the resurrection. And so, once again, welcome. May we have a good time. I know there will be tears, but there will be joy. There will be learning. There, there will be uh, lots of good memories and the hope of the future. And um, before we start, before we go into our program, I invite you all to bow your heads as we start in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you today that you are the life and the resurrection. And we thank you that even though we pass on this earth, that if we believe in you, that is your promise, we will not die forever. We will die for a time, sleep, and then be gathered to you once again. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have given us this time that we can reminisce and celebrate the life of your servant who was here on this planet, serve the others, and help us learn from him that we may do the same in our life as well. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Be with us. In your name we pray. Amen. At this time, we are going to hear the life story by Eric Raja. I have the honor of sharing the life story of Pastor Alan Robertson, as written by his family. Because of my long friendship with the family, I have also been given the privilege to share some of my personal memories and how Pastor Robertson influenced my life. First, the life story as written by his family. Ellen Willis Robertson was born in Fort Francis, Ontario, but lived and grew up in the small town of Barwick, which was about 30 miles away. He was the eldest of three children with siblings, Norma and Phyllis, who are here with us today. They were privileged to have Christian parents to help mold them into who they are today. His father was a Baptist minister and also ran the local post office. His mother was an elementary school teacher and taught him for part of his early education. While he was growing up, one of Alan's and his sister's favorite hangouts was the local outdoor community skating rink. They will bundle up and help the elderly caretaker to shovel the snow off the rink first before they enjoyed skating. Alan was also played on the town's hockey team. 
and games were scheduled between Barwick and nearby community of Emo. In the summer, Alan loved to play baseball with his friends. In those days, a lot of preparation for the winter was happening in the summer. So his father made sure Alan weeded the garden before heading to the ball diamond. It was also a time to bring in a supply of firewood for the winter. So many days were spent chopping down trees and splitting firewood to be taken to their house in town and stacked for the winter. After this hard work, he would often go with his friends down to the creek at the mouth of the rainy river where they would go for a swim to cool off. One of the early jobs Alan had was that during the winter he would go very early to the local Baptist church and then to the Anglican church to start the fire in the wood stove so the churches would be warm for the service. Alan was a very diligent student and made sure his homework was always completed and correct. It seems even back in those days Good enough was never good enough as he aimed for perfection. After high school graduation, Ellen took a six-week summer school course and then became the principal as well as taught children in a two-room, 72-student schoolhouse for a year just outside Thunder Bay, Ontario. The next summer, he took another six-week course and taught for another school year. He then decided to pursue another career. While in Thunder Bay, he became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and determined to attend Canadian Union College in Lacombe, Alberta to take theology. He worked in the summertime as a coal porter selling religious books to pay for his schooling. It was here at CUC that Alan and Dorothy met and dated. They were married in Vancouver, BC in August 1959. After Alan graduated with a Bachelor's of Theology degree, he was asked to stay on and fill in for one of the professors who took a leave of absence to further his own education. Alan then went to Andrews University in June of 1961, while Dorothy stayed in Lacombe to wait for the birth of their eldest daughter, Joy, in July. She was born on a Sabbath, and a telegram was sent to Alan at Andrews University. But the telegraph office was closed. So on, on Sunday, and Alan didn't know, he had become a father until two days after the event. In August, Dorothy and Joy flew to Andrews where the family lived for one year. Alan was sponsored by the BC Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. His first assignment being an associate pastor of the Vancouver Central Church. This was a happy time for Dorothy to be close to her parents and to attend her home church again. In those days, the pastors were transferred rather frequently. Williams Lake, BC was Allen's first pastorate where the district included Beaver Valley, Prince George, and McBride. Their second daughter, Althea, was born in Williams Lake in 1964. Alan pastored many other churches, including Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Vancouver Central as senior pastor, Overland Park, Kansas, a return call to Vancouver Central, and then to Calgary Central. He was then invited by Canadian Union College to join the religion department, which gave him five years at the blackboard and studying like a bear to keep ahead of his many students. His favorite subjects to teach were Adventist church history and homiletics or preaching. Many of his theology students went on to make a mark in the Adventist church. Excellent pastors, conference presidents, 
administrators and a seminary professor. He looked back on those days with pleasure as he really enjoyed teaching and helping others to grow in their own ministry. Later, he pastored in College Heights and Medicine Hat, Alberta, then accepted an invitation to Kelowna, BC, where he ministered for six years before retirement. He enjoyed teaching Bible classes on Sabbaths and midweek meetings. His special talent was to combine his teaching ability when presenting his weekly sermons for the congregation. People would remember what the sermon was about for weeks afterwards due to his repeating of the main point, so unique presentation. He was a stickler for timing too. Many people remember that he insisted to start his sermon at 11.30 so he could finish on the dot of 12 and be walking down the aisle. He often said, the mind, mind can only absorb, absorb what the seat can endure. Some of the important events in his life include a Holy Land tour sponsored by the It Is Written TV program, attending general conference sessions, attending college pastors retreats, baptizing new members, marrying many couples, young and old, conducting funerals for many other friends. In the year 2000, he received an award of excellence from CUC, a happy time meeting fellow grads from long ago. The family went on to tour of Europe in 1979, and in 2001, he and Dorothy were able to spend some time exploring the Maritimes. Both parents were proud to attend the graduation of both of their daughters from Walla Walla University. Alan played soccer on Sunday mornings with the men from the Saskatoon church where he developed a desire to run and run some more. One friend remembers that even though Alan was older, he could still outrun his young friend. Another man almost had a heart attack when Alan took him out on a country road and they jogged as far as Alan could go. Luckily, the poor man did survive. While in Kansas at a church camp out, a hayride was planned one evening. On the way back to camp, he decided he didn't want to just sit on the wagon, so he got off and started jogging along. Another young man decided to do the same. They ran alongside the wagon for a while, for a few miles, and finally, Alan was the lone jogger as the wagon turned into the camp. In the later years, he became a dedicated walker, and while living in Kelowna, he walked the same pathway at Brand Creek every morning and made many friends whom he loved to greet. He followed sports, especially hockey, and thought Wayne Gretzky was the greatest. At the time of leaving Calgary Central Church, a special hockey jersey was shown showing Los Angeles King number 99 on the backside, but Calgary Flames on the front. This jersey is displayed on the table out in the foyer. Daughters Joy and Althea surprised their parents with the 30th anniversary dinner at a friend's home in Lacombe. They also were present to help plan special 40th, 50th, and 60th anniversaries, which were celebrated in good style and a pleasant memory now for Dorothy. Dorothy accommodated Ellen's need for a quiet study time at home every day, especially as he prepared for his sermons. She accompanied him the last few few years so he could walk in the neighborhood and always had nutritious meals waiting for him on time. 
Dorothy was his caregiver for the last nine months of his life at home. COVID and pneumonia took over his lungs, causing his final rest in sleep. We all await the resurrection morning when Jesus will come to take us home and all of us will be given new and healthy bodies never again to see sickness. I like to reflect a little bit on my personal memories and the influence that Pastor Robertson had on my life. My dad arrived from Sri Lanka in Vancouver in 1970s, in the early 70s, looking for a church home. He went to the Vancouver church and met up with Pastor Robertson. And later, my brothers and I and my mother arrived in Vancouver and met the rest of the family. I still remember the meal that we had at your home right across from Deer Lake School. We were new to Canada and we were welcomed and embraced and accepted into the church family as well as into their family. Little did I realize my path would cross at CUC when I was a student in Elder Robertson's class. Then as a member of his congregation, when he became the pastor of the College Heights Church, his daughters, Joy and Althea, worked with me as students in the finance office at CUC and Althea later in my business in Red Deer. Candy, my wife, graduated with Joy and asked her to be her bridesmaid at our wedding. The most significant event was when Candy and I asked Pastor Robertson to perform our wedding. I remember those seven counseling trips to Calgary. There would be no shortcuts. The trip had to be made, four hours, and a full hour of counseling. And the homework had to be done independently and mailed to him by post a week before our counseling session so he could be prepared. Sometimes, Joy, I thought your dad's calling was to be an army sergeant. <laughs> I learned that there was no shortcuts to a lasting marriage. It took discipline and effort. We kept in touch during visits to Kelowna. We walked, we talked, we caught up with news about church and church members that he dearly cared about from his previous churches. We shared many meals and no visit was complete without prayer. Last November, after a visit at their home, Kenny and I realized our walks had come to an end. The talks have concluded as well, but his words will ring in my ears and his influence will last a lifetime. So over a span of nearly 50 years, our lives, our lives were enriched by the association with the Robertson family. So it's only natural at a time like this to think of the loss. But for a few moments, I do not want to think of the loss, but to share with you what Elder Robertson has left behind. He has left behind words and actions that can continue to shape our lives. And by living those words, we can honor his life. One of his favorite sayings to theology graduates was, prepare the sermon and preach the conclusion. It is in that context I will get to the point and bring this to a conclusion. I will use his own words. He made three points in his sermon at our wedding. I don't know how many of you will remember your wedding sermon. Because it was Elder Robertson, I remember them 
well. I told him once, even if my marriage doesn't last, his sermon will. <laughs> These words are not just for a marriage, but words that will help us live our lives meaningfully together among our families, communities, and in this world. First he said, see eye to eye with your partner. Some years later, I complained to him that it was impossible. He explained that we needed to see the big picture together. As a community, as families, we need to be able to see that, to live in harmony. Second, he said, walk hand in hand. Strive to walk with each other and with God. By, walk hand, by walking hand in hand, you will not go in opposite directions. Finally, kneel side by side. Include God in your everyday life. As Pastor Robertson would summarize very quickly his three points, see eye to eye, walk hand in hand, kneel side by side. I'm grateful for the influence that Elder Robertson has been on my life as a teacher, pastor, and friend. Many of you who know him will know that he has been an influence in your lives as well. Thank you, Mrs. Robertson, Joy, Dale, and the sisters for sharing his life with us. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I would like to start out by saying thank you to each one of you for taking time to join us um, at this difficult time and for taking time to be part of this service. Um, I know some people have come from Parksville as far as that goes for the west and some people have come from Winnipeg in the east and other points in between and we gr greatly appreciate that. And also thank you to all of our online friends and family who are also watching. This afternoon, I'd like to take a few moments to reflect on the importance and power of our words. Words can influence us for good or evil. They can challenge and change us, stir emotions and imagination and help us to gain an understanding of the world and of God. Words were very important to my father, and he cherished sharing them. Nowadays, we hear about people being social media influencers. And I'd like to propose that my father used his words to be a spiritual influencer. As a committed Christian, an outstanding Bible scholar and a man who dedicated his talents and creativity to God, I believe his words leave us a rich legacy. There are three main areas in his life that I've chosen to focus on. Firstly, I believe my dad used his words as gifts to his congregations. He was not a person with many hobbies but instead chose to focus most of his energies on his greatest passions in life, which were spiritual topics and preaching. Most people here today have heard my dad preach, but for those who haven't, <clears throat> he had a way of making it appear very easy. However, this wasn't always so, and I'd like to share a few behind the scenes details. When he was a student at the Andrews University Seminary, he had to practice giving sermons in a homiletics or preaching class. The professor consistently gave my dad positive feedback on his sermon content, but told him that his delivery needed some improvement, that he relied too much on his notes. 
Because of my dad's hesitancy to preach without notes to begin with, he received a B plus in the class, which was deeply disappointing to him. Ironically, my dad received A's in every other class, in every class except the one that he became so proficient in. Early in his ministry, he bought books on preaching and took the plunge to preach without notes. My mom remembers that his first sermon without notes lasted for 10 minutes. <laughs> but he persevered and practiced until he did it with excellence. He felt strongly about giving his congregation consistent spiritual food and took great care to make sure that his words and points were clear and concise. Growing up, my dad had a scheduled routine of studying the Bible and preparing sermons every morning. He spent an average of 20 hours a week in sermon preparation, often referencing several of his 3,500 books. He mostly presented expository sermons, but also did a few first-person narratives. Whichever method he chose, his goal was that the message would be remembered long after it was over. I'd say he did fairly well in that, because Dale and I still remember the talk he gave at our wedding ceremony too. He outlined that a marriage should revolve around three C's, Christ-centeredness, commitment, and communication. I'm glad to know he didn't preach the same one for each of us. <laughs> Secondly, <clears throat> I believe my dad used his words as gifts to his students. The teaching part of his career started immediately after high school graduation in Ontario, as was briefly mentioned before. At that time, there was such a shortage of public school teachers that he took a six-week summer school class and became a teacher and principal at the age of 19. The first year he taught, his students did average in their provincial exams. But as an ever intelligent and quick learner, my dad changed his teaching strategies and his students did much better the following year. Fast forward a number of years to when my dad taught theology and religion classes at Canadian Union College, which is now called Berman University in Alberta. Pastor Ern Brake will um, be talking about my dad as a theology instructor, but I have a memory <clears throat> of taking a class from my dad as well. It was called Life and Teachings of Jesus. I remember he didn't like it when students were tardy. And the other thing I remember is that he used his class time very efficiently and had clear outlines. He also had a way of making it reasonably easy to get a B in his class, but much more challenging to get an A. Of course, I wasn't about to let my dad give me a B, so I put in the extra effort and got an A. And lastly, I believe my dad used his words as gifts to his family. I have numerous memories of my father reading aloud to us, and that's one way that he shared of himself with us. He read us the Bible, short stories, books, articles, and poems. Although we're sad <clears throat> that my sister passed away 10 years ago and isn't here with us, I know I speak on her behalf as I share these remembrances. One impression from our childhood was my dad reading aloud all seven books of the Chronicles of Narnia. These books are rich in description and imagination, and my dad read with great expression. At the end of each chapter, we would beg for just one more. Another favorite recollection of him reading is of him reading humorous um, poetry, such as The Cremation of Sam McGee, by Robert W. Service. Additionally, my dad used his words as gifts to his family by expressing thanks and encouragement. 
The last nine months have been very difficult for my dad with his declining health, but also very challenging for my mother as a caregiver. One of his uh, <clears throat> favorite expressions to me over the years was, be of good cheer, and he was quick to give compliments and point out good qualities and always express gratitude to my mother for all that she did. One characteristic about my father was his remarkable ability to remember poems and song lyrics off the top of his head. Each spring, at some point, he'd quote the Daffodil Poem by William Wadsworth. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, flat, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. And each September he'd slip in the poem by Helen Hunt Jackson. The golden rod is yellow, the corn is turning brown, the trees in apple orchards with fruit are bending down. But not all of his poetry was serious, and sometimes he'd quote funny and light-hearted poems like the one by Jessica Nelson North. I had a little tea party this afternoon at three. It was very small, three guests in all, just I, myself, and me. Myself ate up the sandwiches while I drank up the tea, and it was I who ate the pie and passed the cake to me. <clears throat> I would like to close by sharing an anecdote that I'll always treasure. Some of you will know the older song called The Red River Valley, about a lady in Manitoba who's sad that the soldier she loves must leave the Red River Valley. <clears throat> Over the years, I've made many trips to Kelowna to visit my parents and my mother-in-law. One time, as I was saying goodbye to my parents, true to character, a song popped into my dad's head. As he thought of me leaving the Okanagan Valley, it reminded him of lyrics from the Red River Valley song. And he sang to me, From this valley they say you'll be leaving. We will miss your bright eyes and sweet smile, for you take with you all the sunshine that has brightened our path for a while. And now to my dad I say, from this valley we know you have left us. We will miss your sweet <clears throat> smile and bright eyes, but you leave with us all the memories that have brightened our paths for a while. Thank you. Many people knew Pastor Alan Robinson first as a, as a brother, then as a husband, and then as a dad. And many people knew him as a pastor and as a retired pastor. I first knew him as a student. He was a teacher and I was a student. One of my first memories of him was in 1981 in September as the... Uh, school season was beginning and it was uh, his job to interview me as a young theology student. I got the impression that I would pass or fail based upon his assessment of me and uh, he was to make a judgment whether I was pastor material or not. But the interesting thing is I, I didn't want to be a pastor, I never intended to be a pastor. Uh, he asked me, why did you come to Canadian Union College? And I said, I came because um, 
as an atheist, I found God, and I gave up my job. I worked on a train system as a porter. I gave up Dalhousie University, and I left my friends from Nova Scotia, and I came to CUC based upon Matthew 6.33, seek ye first. I told him this, and I could see in his eyes that I didn't fit the mold of a pastor uh, because I had no idea what a pastor was or even hardly what a Christian was. But I came there to hear the word of God. I came there to figure out what was God's will now for my life that I had given up my former life. And I have to tell you that uh, uh, if I could use a metaphor of a train going through the mountains and then coming to a gully and a train can't go across unless there's a trestle to get to the other side. And Pastor, He, he was my trestle. And he got me to the other side. I was so new to Christianity, to church. So after I shared with him, I began to realize what kind of a man I was dealing with. First of all, he listened. James chapter 1 and verse 19 says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. He listened. He wasn't like the other professors that I'd had in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He was a Christian gentleman who listened to you. And then he analyzed. He had a mind like a steel trap, but he didn't use it to trap you. And then he applied his heart so his brain and his heart working together. And so he became my counselor, my mentor, my professor. Uh, and he advised me. He said, you're not sure which way you're going. I said, no, I don't know. All I know is I'm here to hear the word of God and let God lead me. And so he said, okay. Consider taking this class first. And then if this class doesn't work out, you can take this class next. And if this class does work out, then you know what to do next. And so he laid out the steps that I would be taking. And I recognized that as a professor, as a, as a teacher, he was also like a shepherd, guiding a lost sheep. And so he used that intelligence of his, that intellect of his, that Bible knowledge, which he applied to practical living, to my life as a, as a young student. I was 20 or 21 years old at the time. When I was asked to give a, a little tribute for Pastor Alan Robertson, I sat down and I thought, what's he like? What are some adjectives that I would use to describe him? And I, I couldn't stop describing him until after I got 22 adjectives. And uh, I wrote them down. I, I don't know if I should read them all to you or not, but uh, I asked my wife, well, what do you make of him? because my wife and I were students both in his class. She was there with me, and we both graduated together. And I like to say what my wife said of him, which is exactly what I say of him. He was the epitome of a Christian professor. Kind, gentle, respectful, conscientious, dedicated, knowledgeable, and a caring Christian gentleman professor, he always got the feeling that he wanted the best for you. That was certainly true of him. 
in his classes, he taught homiletics, like has been mentioned before. It's it's interesting, Joy, what you said about about him. I and Eric, what you what you said too. Uh, in my experience in his homiletics class, his he told all the students, he says, I want you to write out your sermon word for word. So write it all out. And we all complained. That's that's all that's a big job. And I, okay, he was pushing us. And so 15 pages later, I had my sermon written. It took me a long time to get that thing done. So long, in fact, I actually didn't finish writing it. And I had to ad lib it at, <laughs> at the end of it all. And he had us all preaching to the classroom. I have to tell you, that was the first and last time I ever preached a sermon from notes. Um, but he, he knew that. And he says, I want you to do it anyway. You need to have like the experience of, of doing that. Another time he, he said to the class, this is a textbook we'll be using. It's called the homiletical plot. I don't know if you preachers out there know that book. It's, I know it just was reissued in the year 2000, but we had it in 1981. And it talked about how to turn a sermon into a narrative. And I was complaining to him after class. I said, narrative sermons, we don't need stories. We need the, the meat of the word, you know. And, and he said, you know, I agree with that. That's exactly what we do need. But give this a go. Just just read it and just listen on in class, and you just see where this goes. I think I think you'll like it. And sure enough, it, it was it went well. It went very very well uh, because of the way he was he was teaching. I said that he was a listener and he used his intellect as well as his heart to guide his students. I remember one day I came to him with a research idea, and it wouldn't fly. He knew it wouldn't fly. It's about, you know, doing something in the college and interviewing students and stuff like that. And, and he was so diplomatic in telling me that I was, uh, what would be a good word? Uh, full of garbage, I guess, would be the word. Um, and he just had a kind way of saying it so that he didn't offend you, you know. But I was wrong, and he was right, and he had to be so kind and gentle and diplomatic to say, he'd call me Ernie, said, that's just not, that's not going to work. <laughs> there are people who you're trying to do this with and they don't think like you think. And then he went on and explained uh, all that. After a while, the students in the class, this was the homiletics class, I also took life and teachings of Jesus, I took uh, introduction to ministry and and I think uh, the book of John, maybe, and other classes. Uh, the class said, Pastor Robinson, why don't you preach a sermon? Here, we are all preaching sermons into the class. Let's hear the master do it. And so we put him on the spot, and I don't know if he's going to do that anyway, but he, uh, he did. Well, that was 40 years ago, and I remember that sermon to this day. It was about agape love. And I've used the illustrations that he's used when I go and try to share agape love from the Bible, from, from what he, he shared. Um, he was uh, someone who, uh, when we left, we, we graduated and left in 1985, went to Newfoundland. My wife was a teacher and I was a pastor. Came back to British Columbia and reconnected with him here in the Kelowna Church. And uh, when I saw him, I couldn't help but remember how he was that trestle that got me from one mountain peak to the other. I needed to have somebody who was both intellectual, honest to the scriptures, and had the wisdom to apply God's inspired word to my little life. And I honor him 
and I adored him for that. Thank you very much.
All I can really say after this song is, wow, you heard that comment, because he lives. Well, many of you have had much more contact with Pastor Robertson than I did. We are, as Pastor Peter likes to say, rookies. We've just come to this church maybe six months ago, and I had the privilege to visit uh, Pastor Robertson as he was... Uh, going those last steps. And I remember him when I came to their home, he was lying in his bed. He couldn't get up anymore. And I don't know how much time I spent there, maybe 30 minutes, maybe a little bit more. And as we were talking, he had this most gorgeous smile on his face. And you know, I, I thought to myself, he, he, he has a hard time, right? He, he he knows it's, it's the last steps now. He must be suffering. There must be a pain, I guess. But look at him, smiling the whole time. I was awed. I was like, wow, that, that is something. You know, he, he was smiling in his trouble. And so, I, I don't know uh, what to say and much to say. I, I don't have, as, as I said, too long a history with Pastor Robertson, but from few of your words, I think I got to know him a little better. And as a young pastor, well, I'm not that young, but still have quite a lot of ministry in front of me, I can say, I want to go his steps. And that's the best. When you see someone who has, you know, gone a certain way, and you want to go his steps. I just want to share a few words with you. Uh, thank you for including me and giving a few words of comfort. I want to read a few words who, uh, that appear funny in a sort of way. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2 and following. Solomon says, It is better to go to a house of mourning than, that, than to go to the house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone, the living should take this to heart. And you read these verses and you're like, what in the world? We all like to go to parties. We all like to have fun. But Solomon kind of twists it, twists it around and he says, it's better to go to the place of mourning. I remember as a young student too, walking with some of my friends, uh, there was uh, not far from our uh, seminary where we studied a cemetery and you would go through the cemetery into the beautiful forest and there was you know hiking places and stuff so we would usually go through the cemetery and then go up to the forest and and we would take our time through the cemetery we would lo look at all of these grave sites and read epitaphs and read the names and read about people's life stories. And I can tell you, those were interesting times for me. You could say, what a morbid young man walking through the cemetery enjoying his time. But <laughs> I did. And thought that came to me is, you know what? Sooner or later, one day you will be here. Well, maybe not there, in some other cemetery. And some other young, youngster will pass by your grave. And what will they read on your epitaph? What is our human life? You know, uh, there was a musician in, our, in my home country. Everybody loved him. He, uh, he, he would, he would uh, sing beautiful songs. His name was Georgia Balashevich, for some of you who know uh, my country. He sadly passed away a few months ago in his 60s, too early. He would say, what is life? 
He, say, he says, you go to the grave site and you, you see the, the date of birth and you see the date of death. And that dash in between, he says, that's life. That's life. Depends what you make of it. That's what's going to say on your epitaph, right? We have this life to live it, live it to create it the way we see fit. When we're gone one day, when they look at our picture, they will talk about us. What will they hear? And that's the reason why it's better to be in the house where there's mourning, because you learn. And that's why I said today we will learn today. And I learned how to be a better pastor, how to listen, how to walk with people. And so that's, that's how we go through life. You know, in the end of the Bible, Revelation, Revelation says, John hears the words of, of God. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this. And I imagine John taking his pen to write. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Another awkward Bible text. Blessed are the, those who die? No, no, that's not what it says. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. And I've always said at many funerals, funerals I had, that's the emphasis of the text. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. Yes, we will all die one day, but it depends on how we die, and with who we die, and with what hope we die. So Pastor Robertson, he has slept in Jesus. Now it's up to us to run our race. Now it's up to us to prove ourselves. And I think this is very fitting for someone like Pastor Robertson. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. And I hope that we will learn this day that there's only one life we have. You know, sometimes people think of themselves as, uh, as, as failures or as, uh, you know, I couldn't live my, my life different. My life was against me or, you know, things of that sort. Let's learn today how to live life with God. And then let's live that life so that others may see and learn and know Jesus through us, through what we say, through what we do. That's, that's, that will be our life legacy. Thank you so much for including me. And maybe the last words we can say, Jesus says to John, and John is afraid seeing Jesus. And Jesus says, don't be fearful, John. I am alive forevermore. I was alive and I was dead and now I am alive forevermore. I am the life and the resurrection. And so this Jesus is what we look for and uh, one day when he comes we will look for each other somewhere in that great throng and because he lives we will be there one day. May that be our blessed hope today.
As we're nearing the end of our service today, I would like to all uh, call you to stand as we sing the song, What a Day That Will Be. accept our worship today and our prayers, and then I pray you will bless the food that has been prepared in the fellowship room, and we pray that you will bless us as we look for ways to encourage each other. Thank you for loving.